100 years ago, transatlantic amateur radio is born. It's hard to believe that something that we take for granted, talking on the radio across the Atlantic for radio amateurs was a mere dream 100 years ago. But how did this start? Back in 1901, Guglielmo Marconi heard the letter S in Morse code from across the Atlantic on December 12, 1901. This signal was transmitted from Poldu in Cornwall and received in Newfoundland, Canada. Back then, they used really long waves, low frequencies, and high power. Remember in my other video where I talk about Reginald Fessenden, who used an Alexanderson alternator. This was a mechanical device that generated high-frequency alternating current. Marconi used the same type of alternator for his transatlantic tests, and it was generally thought that the long waves were the only waves that could travel long distances, hugging the curvature of the Earth. Power from the alternator was about 20,000 watts to about 200,000 watts. And back in those days, radio was essentially unregulated, with amateur stations operating amongst the commercial stations. All that changed in 1912 due to the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Not letting a good crisis go to waste, the U.S. Congress passed the Radio Act of 1912. It required all radio stations and operators to be licensed and thus ended the days of chaos and complete freedom. And with that, one of the key provisions that affected radio amateurs was that we were now limited to wavelengths of 200 meters and down or approximately 1500 kilohertz and up, plus or minus. Since everyone thought at the time that only the long waves could carry signals far away, the government essentially limited amateur stations to an effective range of 25 to 40 miles through this restriction. This didn't stop us. Instead, in 1914, it spurred the formation of the American Radio Relay League, which was started in order to form a radio message relay network after its founder, Hiram Percy Maxim, relayed a message via another station in Springfield, Massachusetts. But radio amateurs, not wanting to give up so easily and always looking to work good DX, decided to try to figure out how to make lemonade out of their new lemons. After World War I, which almost ended all amateur radio permanently, some radio amateurs decided that they would try to make contact across the Atlantic, something which only the commercial stations could do now with their long wave privileges. The war itself brought some useful innovations such as high power and high gain tube transmitters and tube receivers. One of these was the regenerative, re regenerative receiver, which was famously used by Maxim himself. This was a huge step up from their previous crystal sets with the Galena crystals and cat's whiskers. For transmitting, new radio transmitters that used tubes were being used, which were much more compact and efficient than the rotary spark gaps that were common at the time. In 1921, the Radio Club of America put the plan into place and built a station with the call sign 1BCG in Greenwich, Connecticut. The 1BCG station was a 10-foot by 14-foot shed in a field in Greenwich. They had a transmitter that used three UV204 radiotron tubes and produced almost one kilowatt. A self-excited, self-rectifying Colpitz oscillator was the original circuit. This was then reconfigured into a master oscillator power amplifier arrangement to overcome the disadvantages of self-excited oscillators and to produce a good quality, pure and stable CW signal. So essentially they had one UV204 in an oscillator and then three more of them used as a power amplifier. They used a motor generator to produce 2000 volts for the plate. The antenna was a flat top cage antenna, about 70 feet tall with two sections, each 50 feet long. They had a corner poise of 30 radials, 60 feet long each. They were elevated seven feet and had two equal fan shaped halves to reduce resonance effects. Understand that in those days, they didn't have the current bands that we have today. Instead, almost everything was on low frequencies. Amateur radio was banished to 200 meters and down, 
And for this test, they used a wavelength of 230 meters or about 1300 kilohertz. Today, that lives within the AM broadcast band. The receiving station was in Scotland, in Ardrisan. However, the transmitted signals were also heard in Amsterdam, England, Germany, and even in Puerto Rico, and on the West Coast in Vancouver, British Columbia, Washington State, and Catalina Island in California. Here's a sample of what the transmitter would sound like on the air. You can hear the full audio at 1bcg.org, where they have a much longer presentation on the history of this event. But this event was not a first lucky hole-in-one. Rather, it came after a failure of the first transatlantic tests, which were held in early 1921. You see, a visionary named Milton Sleeper of Everyday Engineering made a bold proposition. And I quote, It is hoped that during the coming winter, the next transatlantic conquest will be recorded. That is the transmission from a 200 meter, one kilowatt experimental station of radio messages to England. The first experimenter to transmit across the Atlantic will set a new standard for 200 meter sets. His name will never be forgotten as long as there are radio experimenters. Mr. Philip R. Corsi of the Radio Review and Wireless World, NRSGB, whose aid has been requested in handling the receiving arrangements, will have no difficulty in en enlisting the most able English operators and the best equipped stations. And I unquote, Leon Deloy, who held the call sign 8AB in France, heard about this from an article in Wireless World magazine and wrote Everyday Engineering to perform this test from his home in Nice. Everyday Engineering ceased publication in September 1920, but the final edition published his letter. Dear Sir, having read in the September 18th issue of the Wireless World that American amateurs wish to make some transatlantic tests, I inform you that I would gladly cooperate with them in these tests. I have a highly sensitive reaching station located at Villa des Hautes Roches, 55 Boulevard de Montbouron, Nice, France, where I will return early next month to stay until the summer and at which I get good signals from America. I have been for the last two years of the war detached by the French High Commission in Washington to the Navy Department for Transatlantic Radio Work, I, I would be especially pleased to help in any possible way American radio amateurs in this interesting attempt. In the hope of wearing you soon at my hearing you soon at my niece address, I am, dear sir, yours sincerely, Leon Deloy. Well, the AWRL actually took this over and published in the February 1921 issue of QST because that magazine was um, defunct. They reported arrangements have not been completed fully at the writing and it is impossible to give schedules, etc. But the plans of Mr. Sleeper will be followed with as little change as possible. The American entrance probably transmitting on schedule on the nights of February 1st, 3rd and 5th. Sadly, the attempts failed and were reported in Wireless World, a UK publication. In the early hours of the 2nd, 4th, and 6th of February 1921, 25 amateur wireless stations in the United States were scheduled to transmit signals with a power of 1 kW on a wavelength of 200 meters for the purpose of establishing communication with enthusiasts on this side of the Atlantic. Over 250 wireless amateurs in the United Kingdom enrolled their names with Mr. Philip R. Corsi, BSC, the organizer of the tests in England, and by the closing date for the reception of reports, February 14th, Valentine's Day, some 30 logs of signals received were forwarded to the wireless world. The work of checking the logs against the transmission program has just been completed, and in our next issue, we hope to publish a detailed consideration of the results obtained. Meanwhile, we may state that although every log has been carefully perused and checked, not one entrant has received a single word or signal which can unquestionably be attributed to an American amateur station. Q 
QST in May reported that something had been heard, but reception could not be verified. Kenneth Warner, then AWRL secretary, made a bet of his spring hat that they could achieve success in the test if they were sent if they sent an American to England with the best new radio technology. One thing that was done was move the test in December, where the atmospherics would be quieter, maybe propagation would be a little better. The AWRL held its first convention in Chicago in August of 1921, and plans were made to send a representative. They ended up sending a gentleman by the name of Paul F. Godley, who had to his name several innovations in amateur radio, and was definitely the man for the job. He sailed on November 15th and would make it in time for the tests. Of course, the UK was a bit concerned that, Amer- that an American was being sent to show them how to do it. With Wireless World writing an article that said, if our efforts were so criticized then, one dares not think what would be a, what would be said if a good U.S. amateur must come over here to show us how it should be done. But Godley was still undeterred, and as we know now, the tests were successful. And of course, they won the hat, which you can see here. And this year, QST from ARL and Radcom from the RSGB produced matching covers with the hats to commemorate this momentous occasion. Now, 100 years later, in 2021, there will be reenactments of this famous feat. However, since 1300 kHz is used for AM broadcast, the reenactment will take place on a higher frequency in the 160 meter band. The Radio Club of America will send the original message plus a new message using Morse code on December 12, 2021 at 0252 Zulu or 9.52 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, December 11th. You can tune in on 1825 kilohertz. They will be using the call sign W2RCA. They will send a message to the commemorative station GB2ZE in Ardrasan. A replica of the original transmitter will also be operated as W2AN stroke 1BCG and they'll be using a frequency of 1821 kHz using Morse code. These will take place from the Vintage Wireless Museum Museum in Connecticut. You can get an SWL certificate for this special event by sending a copy of the transmitted message to 1BCG at antiquewireless.org. The schedule is that the transmissions will start on December 11, 2021 on 1.821 MHz, plus or minus at 1800 Eastern Time or 2300 UTC, then every 15 minutes thereafter for a total of five hours. And finally, if you'd like to take part in commemorating this historic event, the AWRL will have the Centenary QSO party, where both W1AW and GB2ZE will be operating and will award, award a quench. I don't know how to pronounce it, Someone Scottish could tell me a traditional Scottish drinking cup to the first stations in North America and the UK to complete the contacts with both W1AW and GB2ZE. Even further than that, there's an international amateur radio marathon on the HF bands in December 22. All of the links to these events are in the description below, so be sure to check them out. And be sure to like and subscribe to this channel as I'll be putting out even more great videos and even live streaming some of these things as I receive them on the air. Until next time, I am N2RJ, 73.